I'm Cynthia James, and this network is about changing lives one woman at a time. Welcome to Women Awakening. I'm your host, Cynthia James, and I'm so grateful that I get the honor to introduce you to extraordinary women, women that inspire me, women that have said yes to their lives, women that have taken uh, sometimes uh, lemons and made lemonade. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you. You know, we, we do these every week and we're uh, anywhere you can get a podcast, Spotify, iTunes, iHeart, Spreaker, Amazon, uh, YouTube. Just subscribe and come back every week and meet a woman who has said yes to her life. So my guest today is Dr. Karen Gedney, an amazing story. I'm just going to give you a little bit of her history. She grew up hiking and skiing in the Catskill Mountains in New York State, and her parents' life was deeply affected by World War II. Karen's grandmother, along with her mother and her seven siblings, tried to escape when the Russians invaded Germany. And then Karen's mother and her family spent years surviving starvation, lice, freezing, and being held prisoner under the Russians. That trauma caused her mother to be overprotective and isolating, which could have caused Karen to be painfully shy and feel socially awkward. But from the time she was nine years old, Karen dreamed about being a doctor. She'd read countless stories about doctors and, and she thought about the adventure, the danger, the romance, and the methods to take care of the underdog. And so Part of the allure to medicine was that as a doctor, people would need her help. So she, in order to finish medical school, she received a scholarship and in exchange, she was required to spend four years caring for the underserved. And she was directed to the Northern Nevada Correctional Center where she became the first woman doctor to serve at a men's prison. Before the four years were up, she was determined to turn her work in, as a prison doctor into a career. She saw the difference she could make in a population that needed a doctor who would stand up for them and protect them from abuses of power. But then on Friday, the 13th of October, 1989, she faced a huge challenge where she was held prisoner by an inmate he was one of the many patients that she had uh, been supporting, being assaulted and raped by that inmate, and then seeing him killed by the SWAT team affected her emotionally and made her doubt herself. And she had to find a way to deal with the shock, the anger, and then find forgiveness. All of that led her to being an advocate for prisoners and families of prisoners it has become a, a life calling. And I am so grateful that you are here, Karen. Uh, and I'm excited to talk to you and for you to talk about the fuel that makes you do this work on the planet. Well, thank you, Cynthia, for that, uh, let's see, uh, introduction there. And uh, I'm really honored to be on your podcast, because I've listened to a number of them, and you have a very eclectic, interesting group of women who um, I look at bringing light into dark places. And, uh, and I will say a prison, and the way it is structured and the way it runs, this is an incredibly dark place. And uh, when I retired, I ended up writing my book, but I did it as a, sort of a two-pronged approach. One was a bit of a psychotherapy session for myself, you know, to process 30 years in the prison. And the other was um, to try to get the outside world to see the inside of the prison through my eyes, which I had eyes where I was curious. I uh, lacked the judgmental gene somehow. And I was always, what should I say, 
empathetic and compassionate to especially the underdog or the people who are on the bottom. I think I learned that from my mother, you know, listening to the stories of war. And um, I also had a very unique, what should I say, uh, entrance into the prison because one, I was the first female doctor they had ever been exposed to in the prison setting. And you'd have to imagine this is more than 35 years ago. Here I am, this tall blonde walking into the prison. And I was married to a black man, okay, in Carson City, Nevada, wow. which uh, <laughs> had no black people. I mean, none, like 40,000 in the city. No, no blacks. And when I entered the prison, um, one out of four of my patients were black. And, it, you know, in the three prisons on the outskirts of Carson City, which was just wild to me because I couldn't wrap my head like where'd they come from? And I didn't realize in those days, this is back in the 80s, they hadn't built the big prisons in, the, in Las Vegas yet, that area of Nevada. Right. So they had been shipping them up north. OK, right. you know, away from their families, you know, and everything else. Um, well, and, I, I want to. I'm sorry, yeah. I, I want to get back to this, but I want to I want to just I'm fascinated by your story because I because, first of all, where you came from, the lineage, you know, uh, uh, where you came from and your mother being overprotective, but you being this curious child. And, yeah, I, and, <laughs> yeah. So so what 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 was it that kept calling you to be a doctor? Um Aside from, you know, being attracted to the underdog, what was it? You know, it, that's a, it's sort of an odd one for me because I'm maybe an anomaly in that neither one of my parents even graduated high school and they never really encouraged me to be a doctor. They had this sort of German mindset like, you should get a real job. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, yes. All right. There, there, there's that. And then the other thing is my mother was very affected because she grew up in, let's say, sort of like uh, the child of a farmer and a butcher and, you know, work with your hands and had a real class consciousness like, uh, in Germany, it's Frau Doctor, you know, I mean, it's like a whole different class. And so I don't think she ever wrapped her mind around how she had a kid who wanted to be a doctor. In fact, uh, my parents sort of made it clear, like, that's nice, but on eight, at 18, you're on your own. Right. So uh, I just was unbelievably fortunate to get scholarships. Um, yeah. Otherwise, uh, I, I don't see how in the world I could have ever done it. Uh, and I was oriented to work. So I worked a lot as a the waitress and things like that. Uh, yeah. And when you said, you know, what was it about being the doctor? When I was in school, I really loved science and I loved uh to try to understand why people thought like they did and why they acted like they did. But also I was always in this questioning mode. And, and I also think in third grade, I ended up in the hospital for a week and it was such a horrible experience for me. And I mean, horrible experience for me that I somehow decided also that I had to make sure that I would have to be a doctor to take care of myself. Yes. You see what oh, I mean? That's tough. Yeah. That. Right. I mean, that, that was, that was a piece of it, but also there was, as you mentioned in my little introduction, I romanticized what it was to be a doctor. I mean, I was reading novels like Buccaneer Surgeon, <laughs> Surgeon of the Roman Legion, you know, <laughs> where it, it, in my mind, in my mind growing up, I, I just looked at the adventure and the romance and making a difference and fighting against abuses of power. And I made the decision to be a doctor. And I still remember this nine years old. Um, my parents, because they were German and my father 
he made his two daughters. I was the oldest. My sister's one year younger. He basically made us do everything he had wanted to do as a child, but because of his miserable upbringing, had never been able to do. So he wanted to play the accordion. So I had to play the accordion. And I'm not musically gifted at all. That was really problematic for me. And I remember going to an accordion lesson class, you know, and on the drive, I'm looking out at the window and I'm thinking about the stories I read. And I remember I want to be, I'm going to be a doctor. And I remembered that I had to remember this moment in time because I knew that's what I was going to do. And I knew it would happen. It never occurred to me all the hurdles I would have. Right. And when it was a uh, calling. Yeah, yeah, it was, I just knew it. I mean, it was one of those things I just knew. And when I told my, uh, you know, in school, you go to seventh grade and they go guidance counselor, who was a male. And he said, well, your scores are quite high. What do you want to be? And I said, well, I want to be a doctor. And, you know, he like pulls his glasses down. He looks at me, he goes, wouldn't you rather be a nurse? (laughs) <laughs> all right all right now mind you you know i grew up in the 50s and 60s and um but, <laughs> but the thing is cynthia uh in that moment when he said that i absolutely made my decision that um i was on my own no one was ever going to help me right and, and this this was a bad decision because it made my getting there more difficult because I never asked for help. You see what I mean? Right. Well, that mindset began the focus. Yeah. The uh, mindset of uh, I'm going to do it on my own because you also told me I couldn't. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, I, so I, you know, uh, you've listened to my podcast and, you know, I came from a pretty traumatic childhood. And so, you know, reading your bio was, was very interesting for me because it was like, you went through something that was quite traumatic. And I, I want to ask you two questions yeah. about it. What was your mindset for survival while it was happening? And then what did you do to support yourself to heal after the event? Okay. During the event, uh, I made, uh, during the event, I had anger versus fear, which is very different. Yes, it and, is. And it was, you'd have to understand, he was my patient. I took care of him. I tried to help him. I I knew he was dangerous, but I thought I could handle that. And it never occurred to me that he would take me hostage and do those things. That that sort of didn't occur to me. You see what I mean? And so uh, I was angry at myself for being in the predicament. I was angry for the prison allowing it to happen. Because when I, this is a year and a half into my start, and I had enemies in the administration in the prison, they considered me not their tribe. I was a female married to a black man in a good old boy white club who had the mindset, these inmates have nothing coming. And I had the mindset, I am here to heal and do as much as I can. So they leave less of a problem to society than then when they entered. It made no sense to, for me to make the worse. And that, so I had enemies who, let's say, would have wanted to see me killed. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I had anger there. So for me, Anger kept me very focused and I did go back in my, this was a 10 hour event and I did go back and forth in my mind. I can take him. No, I can't. He's, he was a Vietnam vet Marine with a real knife. He had not a shiv, like a make believe prison knife, a real buck knife. And he was trained to kill. Mm -hmm. And so then I also made the decision when it was very obvious he was going to rape me and he told me I'm going to F you dead or alive. Mm -hmm. And I decided 
alive. <laughs> yeah, good. I mean, this is your oh my God, there's two trucks. <laughs> yes. Yes. I can, I'll I can go escape, with alive. maybe. Yes, exactly. Right, I'll go with alive. And when that happened, um, I took control because I decided, okay, if it's going to happen, I am not going to show him one drop of emotion. Okay. To be in absolute control. And and then maybe I'm a little bit, my personality is I want to be in control. That's why I want to be a doctor too. But I, but I sort of intrinsically knew that that was the best for me versus being afraid. And then also there was something, I don't know, almost righteous for me to not give him what he wanted. You see what I mean? Exactly. And so when it happened, I absolutely, you know, I, I dissociated my mind and my body. Yeah. And I remember uh, this, I'm on the floor, you know, of my exam room, basically. And I'm looking at like the dust bunnies and dirt underneath the exam table in the prison. And I'm focusing on that. And I'm just dis- disassociating. And after the event, it was like all the tension in the room went to zero. Mm. Uh, now, and, and then, of course, the SWAT team getting me out with a concussion grenade and everything. When that grenade went off um, and, the, and everything, I, I thought, poor Cliff, that's my husband. I, I never even gave you a baby. And I mean, I really thought that was the last thoughts in my mind, you know, because that concussion thing just, I mean, you're concussed. And and then this big guy in a flak jacket is yelling and screaming and dragging me over the inmate's dead, bloody body. Okay. Now, my healing on the other end was, uh, <laughs> you know, everybody reacts to trauma differently. Yes. So um, they, the warden debriefed me, but I'm being debriefed in front of my husband with a transcriber and I was in shock. So I didn't really tell him really anything. I I didn't tell him I was assaulted or this or that. I, I did the most minimal yes, no, you know, and I was like in shock and I went home and, and I had to hide, you know, I had to hide in my husband's car because of the media and nonsense. So I get home and my husband, my poor husband, he's like out like a light because he had been, you know, it had been waiting for all those hours. And I have so much adrenaline. I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't do anything. And then I did what my German mother, Eva Maria Charlotte, taught me. My mother's still alive. You know, she's like 92. And uh, I scrubbed and cleaned every floor in my house. Mm-hmm. Right. Because I, because for me, some people eat, some people drink. I have to do some physical activity. That's how I was trained. Mm-hmm. And so I cleaned everything. And then I was still wired. I, I couldn't sleep. And the next day, my husband really understood me. He, he understood me. And he didn't pressure me. And he also knew I just could not be around the house because the media were going to attack it. So he goes, okay, Karen, we're going up to Lake Tahoe. That's where, you know, like that's a 40 minute drive from us. And he said, uh, I'm going to, we're going to hike and then we're going to have a great dinner and you're going to dance all night till you drop dead, basically. (laughs) You know, that's what really happened. I just tired myself out. Well, what, first of all, what an incredibly conscious, loving man to know that you've already been traumatized. You don't need to be pushed and prodded anymore. Right. right, right. So, so, so that would, you know, but I also, uh, what, what I, what I, intrigues me about your story is is that you were conscious enough to 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 deal with your own survival in the midst of it and that happens for a lot of people who've had traumatic experiences and then they have to navigate it after but I'm interested in after all of this something in you says I still want to be a benefit to this population and to their families and so Talk to me about that. Yeah, that um, it's a couple of different things. One is 
When I came back, uh, the prison custody office administration, they, they really said nothing. But the compassion I got from the inmate population was incredible. Oh. Incredible, you see, because you'd have to imagine the inmate population. I had been there a year and a half. They knew that I cared about them. They knew that I actually was a doctor with skills. I'm a board certified internist. I give chemotherapy. I, I have skills. So, and, and I was a female and in an inmate convict mentality, their, their code, you might take a guard hostage and hurt them, but someone who is uh, their advocate and, and cares about them and then hurt them, they were like, this is not us. And um, so their compassion was incredible. Um, in fact, I still have uh, the card, you know, 43 lifers, because this particular guy who took me hostage was a lifer. I still have the card. You want to see it? It's right mm -hmm. there. Yeah, this one sec. This is so amazing. So look at this card. Oh, oh, it says to Dr. Gedney. Yeah. Oh, and, and that's see beautiful, the, 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 the rose. Oh, yeah. And the woman's yeah. face and the teardrop. And uh, see, it's signed with little notes and stuff from 43 yeah. lifers because this inmate had been a life sentence and they wanted as a group to say, Dr. Gedney, this is not us, but their compassion really helped me heal. But also it showed me, uh, you know, a side of them that um, you can imagine you're working in an environment where your coworkers or staff or people who are in charge of you, they do nothing. And then <laughs> the group that society has thrown away um, are the ones who um, heal you. Yes. And, yes. and then on top of it, Cynthia, mm -hmm. it was, I had spent a lot of time um, teaching as well the inmates to, what should I say, focus on emotional intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and to understand why they do what they do. And when you teach it, um, you're aware that, okay, events happen and absolutely how you decide how you look at it makes all the difference in the world, yeah. right? I mean, I taught that it's like one thing to teach it. It's another thing to do it, right? Right. But how you deal with the issue is the issue. That, that's right. the only thing. Right. And so I knew, OK, you know, I'm talking to myself. I said, OK, Karen, um, do you want to be afraid the rest of your life about people that you're supposed to take care of? And that'd be like, absolutely not. Uh, do I want to be afraid of sex in the future? Absolutely not. Um, do I want this to, do I want to be a victim? Absolutely not. And, and okay, that's traumatic. What are you going to do? All right. How do I turn a traumatic thing into a triumph? Mm. You, you know, so I, I looked at it as this is a crisis, but it's an opportunity to also transform. And, and uh, I wanted it to mean something, you know, not not uh, be whatever, victimhood. Right. And so um, I ultimately, uh, I even talked about hostage things and rape things with the police department people. I, I talked about it at uh, the prison level, the, the, uh, new in, the new officers coming in, because I really wanted them to know uh, if a staff member has been traumatized, that uh, they don't back away, you know, that the prison comes up with some sort of idea about how to handle trauma. I mean, they, they also didn't know what they were doing. Right. You see. Well, you know, it's, I, what, what is so um, 
inspiring for me is that <clears throat> I believe questions have power. And a lot of times people ask the disempowering questions, but all of your questions were, who do I want to be? How do I want to show up? How do I want to live? Right. And, and then you chose. And so that's, that's exquisite to me. That's, that's, um, um, I think it's an example for all of us because many of us have been traumatized on different levels. Levels, right. And then we get to choose how we want to deal with it. Uh, I want to know, I want people to know how to find you. How, how, how do people find you? <laughs> well, uh, they find me, it's best to go with the website, discoverdrg.com. And DRG is Dr. G, because that's sort of what the inmates would call me because they massacred my name. And, uh, and if people are interested in um, what 30 years behind bars as a prison doctor was like, but also what I really saw that needs to change, uh, my book, 30 Years Behind Bars, Trials of a Prison Doctor. And you always talk about um, women making a difference. And when I left the prison, I realized there had never, ever been a book written by a female prison doctor in the United States, right? And I thought, well, I did 30 years. I sort of grew up in the prison. And also there are very few prison docs that are held hostage in the United States. I mean, that's another very rare sort of thing. And I wanted the outside world to uh, sit on, sort of like be there with me from the day I enter to the day I leave. And I didn't tell, I didn't want to tell them what to think. I wanted them to experience all the stories. And then I, I will say, Cynthia, I get, you know, emails and different things that come back to me where people will say, you know, um, I always hated, hated inmates because X person killed my brother, but this changed everything for me in my life. Or I have had people in the attorney general's office, you know, contact me and said, I've always hated, hated inmates. <laughs> and this changed the way I thought about them. Well, I, I love that you wrote the book and, and I think it, you know, it, it is a different perspective and, and it's, it's a perspective from experience, but also from your passion to be in high service. And so that's, that's exquisite to me. So I asked the same last question of every right. guest. <laughs> yeah. so this show is called Women Awakening. Why do you think this is, this is an important time for women awakening on this planet? I think that women are incredibly good at bringing light and new perspectives and compassion into difficult, dark situations. And I think we're on the precipice of uh, a sort of dark time in terms of uh, polarization and climate and um, the, the new technology, the media that sort of gives the emphasis to everything that's bad because it's attention seeking. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a time that women uh, need to lead in terms of uh, more of the, what I would consider the soft skills, but the incredible skills of nurturing and compassion, healing, understanding, listening, and use power, but not force. I love that. Well, Dr. Karen Gibney, uh, thank you so much for being here, bringing your wisdom and bringing your light and um, your courage and being willing to share it and invite people into a different conversation and dialogue about what does this thing mean to be in service? What does this thing mean to be connected to prison? I'm so grateful for your presence and, uh, and I'm grateful to share you with my tribe. And, and that's wonderful. And I just like to add, it's not just the prisoners. I loved to mentor kids who have a parent in prison to stop that legacy. And, yes. and that's something also, I think that uh, the outside world needs to figure more on the prevention end. Yes. Right. And a lot of, in a lot of instances. 
in, in both in medicine and correctional world fail horribly on that prevention end. Exactly. And I was ahead of foot in both fields. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you for being here. I'm grateful. And um, ladies, I hope you will go to her website. I hope you will get her book um, because this is a woman of courage. Well, thank and, you uh, very much, Cynthia. <laughs> my pleasure to have you here. So ladies, you know, I tell you, I come back here every week. I get to introduce you to these amazing women. And what I want you to know is I want you to just pause and listen to the pearls that they give you, because no matter what lifestyle they're living, what things they've accomplished, each one of them has gotten to a point where they've had to say yes to themselves and make a courageous moment, a courageous act. So please come back. I'm grateful to be with you. Sign up for the podcast. Know that you're important. Know that you matter. Know that your presence on this planet is essential. Only you can came, who came here to do what you came here to do, only you can do it. So much love and I will see you next time. Many blessings. <laughs>